thank you for all the things in your heart you are sharing with us. We pray that as we look into your word concerning this next session now, you will bless us tremendously in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to be the ministers who have called us to be and to do the work thoroughly and to do it successfully that at last we'll hear well done from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For this session we'll be looking at building according to pattern. And in this type of message, I'll be teaching because we really need to see what the pattern of building looks like. And we need to look at a lot of references. The ones I may not be able to read, I'll dictate them if I see that our time is going. But we need to understand that God's work has never been left in the hands of unaided men to plan in human wisdom. How can the all-wise God, who has paid such a great price for redemption, leave the whole task of world evangelization and the task of building the body of Christ in the hands of blind, ignorant men and women as human beings are. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 18, all through to verse 20, hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that ye may see. If it were not God talking in that verse, that will be difficult to understand because it says it's talking to the deaf and it's saying deaf people hear. That means to start with, except the God who can talk to the deaf, the deaf will never hear. This type of message that God wanted to give out to the children of Israel at that time could not be heard by ordinary people. Because he accepted and pointed out they were deaf, and yet they must hear. He said they were blind, and yet they, may, they must look. And if they will look, they will see. It will demand faith on our side. That if we accept that we are blind, yet we look to see, that's faith. If we accept that we are deaf, and yet we want to hear, and we know we are going to hear, that's faith. Then it says in verse 19, Who is blind, but my servant, or deaf, as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind, as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. Many times Jesus spoke to his own disciples, and sometimes he will say, Where is your faith? Sometimes, Why are you so fearful? Sometimes, Do you not yet understand? Sometimes, Is your heart still hardened? And yet there were his disciples. Many times we do not see what he wants us to see. Neither do we hear what he wants us to hear. But I pray that this morning, the Lord himself will open our ears, he will open our eyes, we will see not what a preacher wants you to see, but what he himself, the Lord, the master, the builder of the church, what he wants you to see. What he doesn't want you to know, even if you hear, you'll forget. So there's no problem. But what he wants you to hear, what he knows will help the work he has committed into your hand, he will make you to remember. 
And when the time comes to make use of those things, he'll be able to give you the plan, the know-how, so that you'll apply them to the success and to the growth of the work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. There are times that it will appear that some steps were taken are foolish. But if those steps are coming from God, eventually the outcome will show that the apparent seeming foolishness of God is wiser than men. How wise Lot thought he was when he chose the place he wanted to choose. And Abraham, the older one, took the place that wasn't very interesting. How wise was Abraham because he followed God. The foolishness of God, wiser than men. And how wise it was when Solomon had been confronted by those two halots. And um, one claimed the living, the living child, the other claimed the living child. I thought about it. And I said as an Old Testament king who loved the Lord and who was trying to establish his ministry at that time, his kingship over the people, and he should have wanted to con convince the children of Israel that he stood for purity. If I were, I'll be dealing with the fact that they were even halots. I'll brush the other thing aside. I'll say in Israel, halotry will not be allowed. Let's deal with that first. When I do that, I'll be thinking I'm wise. But that man looked at them, and instead of solving the problem of halotry first, he solved the problem of who has the child. Now, how do you handle that? The dead child can talk, and the living child can't make explanation. It's too young. And the one having the dead child was very, very forceful. The one having the living child also was very, very forceful. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. And as he said, bring me a sword, people thought, what are you going to do? He said, cut the living child in two and distribute to them. Before I read some other parts of the Bible, that's in the past, I thought Solomon must have been very, very wise. Then the Lord started talking to me that all the wisdom we need is in the word of God. Before we continue, let's look at Exodus. Chapter 21. Verse 35. And if one man's ox hurt another's that he die, then shall they divide the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead also shall they divide. Here are two men. One man had one ox. The other man has one ox. One ox pushed down another, killed the other. And the word of God said, you'll divide the living in two, divide the dead in two, distribute to them, let them go their way. And Solomon, as the king of Israel, must have read that, spoken about ox. And you know what Paul said in the New Testament, when he said, you will not muscle the mouth of the ox. And Paul said, is this totally and completely written for the ox or for us? And he said, for us. That even some of those things we read about animals and ox and sheep in the Old Testament, 
there are applications we can make to ourselves. That's the wisdom that Solomon borrowed. And he said, bring me a sword. Here now we do not have two oxen, but we have two children, one dead, one alive. And I discover that if we read the Bible and study the Bible, the wisdom we need to get the work done, God will reveal to us. And as we begin to read the Bible, as general overseers, you will see all the necessary administration that you need. We do not have time, but if you look at how Solomon built the temple, how he got the wood, how he put all the work, all the things we're talking here about the delegation, about supervision, about management, you'll see everything as Solomon built the temple. And we're building the church. And there's so much to learn. And if you read Nehemiah, as he wanted to build the walls of Jerusalem, and he divided the people, and he motivated the people, and he mobilized the people. All we're saying about equipping the people, training the people, mobilizing them, and making them to work, we'll find there. And as we're doing the work of the Lord, it is necessary that we look at the pattern in the scriptures on how to work, how to build. And the Lord will give us the needed wisdom. The gospel work is likened to building. In Matthew chapter 16, Verse 18. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Looking at building according to pattern, here the Lord himself told Peter, I will build my church as a minister. We should be interested in knowing, did Jesus ever build the church? If he did, how did he build the church? Who did he use? What pattern did he give out? Before we look into that, we know that he told Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the very next verse, he said, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Joining those two verses together, it means that Jesus will build the church by using his ministers, the disciples, the apostles, and the gospel workers. I will build the church. And the very next thing he said, in order to build that church, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you authority. I will give you power. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven because you'll need all the authority you can use, all the power you can use, all the divine enablement you need to have, and all the divine support that you need to be able to build it. And so Jesus used the disciples and the apostles in building the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. What we're learning here is that it's Christ building the church. But then he has committed the keys of the kingdom to his own disciples, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, gospel workers in general, so that they, by his enablement, anointing, power, and authority, they will build the church. And here we're given Paul as an example. 
He said, as a master builder, wise master builder. We'll be looking at his pattern later. How God used him in building the church. But let's come back to Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Let's slowly think about Christ, all that he did. He said, all these things that I'm doing, as I've seen the Father doing, even so have I done. So if Christ is building the church, we must then go back to the Old Testament because they said, as I've seen the Father, what I hear from him, I say. What I see him doing, I do. The instruction I've received from him, that is what I'm carrying out. The examples I've seen from my Father, that is what I do. Then let's think about the Old Testament. Did he do any building in the Old Testament? What was the involvement of the Father? The very first building we can think about will be the Ark of Noah. Was Noah allowed to make the specifications on his own? To build like he wanted? No. The type of wood he was to use, the pattern, the stories, the various levels, God told him and said, Noah, this is what to do. And we reach at the end of the whole thing that when he had finished, he built that ark according to what the Lord God in heaven had told him. And that ark was able to provide security and protection for his family. If we build according to God's specification, the church will be able to provide security, protection, and all the things that will be needed. We see another building, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. God called Moses and he told him about the tabernacle. I don't know how many times I have read Exodus chapter 25 to chapter 40. The details were so much. And as I've read over and over, I doubt if any Israelite would have been able to build that tabernacle and all the utensils and all the instruments according to what God told Moses if Moses had not stayed with them supervising the building of that tabernacle. And then the people that were used of God to build that tabernacle, it says God gave them wisdom so that they could build that tabernacle. And if the Old Testament has any message for us, it means that if we're building the church today, according to Christ's specification, one, we must have heard from the Lord. It's not easy to be a general overseer if we have not got a vision from the Lord, a directive from the Lord, a revelation from the Lord. In fact, that is what makes a man to say that I have a vision, that I know it cannot be carried out in any other way except we start this new part of the body of Christ. Depends on vision, depends on revelation. And then if that general overseer, like Moses, will not stay with the people, if as a general overseer we just call the people and we say now here is a pattern. And all the people involved in the building we just commit the work to them, and then we're now free. We have committed the vision to the hands of the people. It will be difficult for them to carry it out like God showed you. If it's going to be done like God showed you, according to God's specification, according to Christ's own way, the overseer will delegate, but he will supervise. He will delegate, but he will demonstrate. He will leave them to do the work, but he will be following up after them. He will relate with them. He will interact with them. He will make sure that if mistakes are being made, he will say, no, that's not the pattern God showed me on the mount. If there is any deviation, he will be able to say, come back. That's not exactly what I told you. And he will go through again that this is what the Lord wants this denomination, this church, or this group of assemblies to do. That's the will of the Lord. But you know, if we leave the people in the work, and there is no supervision. 
the work will not be done like the Lord has shown us. There was another building. It's a building of the temple that Solomon made. But Solomon, even though Solomon had wisdom, was a young man. Very, very young. David had wanted to build for the Lord. He didn't see any revelation, but out of concern, out of deep thought, and he said, how can I? I live in such a good place like this, and the ark of the Lord is under the tent. And he told Nathan, I'm thinking of this in my heart. I want to do this. And Nathan said, go ahead. The Lord is with you. But God went to Nathan and said, go back to David and tell him that he cannot do that. His hand is full of blood. He is being a mighty warrior. That was my intention for him. To be a man that will crush the enemies of Israel. That's the reason I called him. And it's alright. But because of that, he cannot build that temple. The God of peace will not live in a temple built by the man of blood. And so he told him, but because that thing was in his heart, I will bless him. You tell him, his son will build it. But the Lord showed him by the Spirit the pattern of the building. Before he died, he brought all the instruments together, all the gold, all the silver, everything that will be needed. Some things that are very, very substantial. And he called his son, he said, Solomon, be wise. Have real wisdom. Lead these people. And the Lord has shown me, you'll build the temple. And he gave him the pattern. Solomon was wiser than David. Because God himself said, he'll give him wisdom. He'll give him riches. More than any king before him, his father included. And more than any king after him, all the other people. But the pattern had been given by God to David. You know, sometimes uh, we general overseers, the Lord has given us the vision, and the Lord has given us the pattern. Then as we're building, we have some of these university chaps coming into the church. Praise God for them. They are born again, and have studied university education, psychology, administration, and a lot of things. And they come to the church. And we general overseers might just relax and rest and say, thank God. Before these university people came, I used to work as if I'm the only one available. Now you studied psychology, be in charge of counseling. You studied administration, be in charge of the church management. You studied finance in the university, now you be in charge of the accounts. And you studied about um, husbandry and dieting in your university, be in charge of all the feeding and everything at our convention. You studied about communication, now about all our Sunday school, you be in charge and you give everything else. Say bye bye. If the church succeeds, it's in your hand. If the church doesn't succeed, it's in your hand. We we'll travel away. You can't do that. Solomon is young. He might have wisdom, but he doesn't have the pattern. Put the pattern in their hand and tell them administering. The company which they taught you at the university outside is different from administering the church. What did they teach you at the university? When a worker is not productive, what did they teach you in administration? Fire him. Send him away. What do we learn in the Bible? Judas Iscariot was one of those people and was even stealing part of the money. Jesus didn't fire him. He didn't even tell the other disciples that he was doing anything. When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they didn't know it was Judas Iscariot. And when Jesus said, the person I put the muscle in his mouth, that's the person. And he did it. They didn't even understand. And he said, what you want to do? Go and do it quickly. They thought he was sending him to give money to the beggars. Is that the administration they teach us at the university? No. It's different. The way we manage sugar-making company is different from the way we have new creature-making church. Different. 
And because of that, a general overseer cannot just say, because these university people are there and they have gone to Bible school, they have gone to university, they have learned this and this, therefore I abandon the work totally into their hands and now I can rest. We cannot rest. We must work. And if we're still alive, and we're still alive, we must supervise that work. Delegate, but supervise. Delegate, but demonstrate. Show the people what to do. In our church here, we have people that are more educated than myself in the secular realm. We have some of them that have master's degrees, doctorate degrees. We have members of the church that have hospitals of their own. We have people that have engineering companies of their own. We have people that uh, in their offices, they are big, great managers, administering many, many workers. But when they come to church, if they are leading house fellowship, if they are zonal leader, anything they are doing, everything we hand over to them. And we say, this is what we do. This church. Over there, they are manager. Over here, they are members. And so, don't let us abandon the work. And the same thing goes for the pastor in the church. Know the vision that God has given you. The same thing goes for the evangelist in a community. Know what the Lord has given you. I'm sure you know that. Billy Graham doesn't seem to be the most educated person in his association. That's the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Now, if you've been to his headquarters, the printing section and the machinery that is there, the machinery that is there when I was there, I was told that the type of machinery, the computerization of everything, how they are sending out things, uh, the things they are using right there, is similar to the machinery that the federal, their government is using at Washington, D.C. But still, even though there are people that may be more educated, yet is the leader. And sometimes, when I listen to his radio message, I listen to maybe more than 50 of them, sometimes they will bring other people to preach, like Clayton Ford, like Wilson, like others who are associated with him. I will tell you sincerely, sometimes, I get more content from the messages of those other people than the content of Billy Graham. Billy Graham has a decision, a policy, that when he preaches the gospel, he's going to preach as if the whole audience were about 13 years of age. That he needs to be simple like that, so that the people can catch what he's saying. The other people don't have that policy. When they talk, they really talk. And they pack a lot of content into their message. And you will wonder, how is Billy Graham their leader? Because these people are very sharp, very forceful. And when they preach with convicting power. But Billy Graham, by the grace of God, he preaches a simple message. And do you know that more people uh, attend or more people uh, respond to the altar call of Billy Graham than the powerful preachers? I don't understand why it is so, but God must have put some anointing upon the leader. And so the leader is still the leader. General overseer is still the general overseer. The pastor of the church is still the pastor of the church. And if you're an evangelist, you have a team, and you have members working along with you in that team, make sure that you are still the leader of that evangelistic team. But you know, when we give up, maybe because we're tired and we cannot, uh, you know, go with the people all the time. Now, the, everything that goes on in our church here, as large as the church is, I try as much as possible to get involved. I told you the other day that the brethren who played, um, you know, in the evenings, I get involved. If I cannot be there, I will listen to, I will tell them to send the cassettes and I will correct uh, the thing. I don't know how to play the trumpet, but I know when it sounds well. 
I may not be able to sing like them, but if I hear somebody singing well, I can say that is good. If it is not good, I know it is not good. Just like I don't know how to cook, but if the, if the soup is uh, delicious, I know it is. So I know what is good. And even if I'm not able to do it, I'll say that thing is not good enough. That's, the, that's leadership. And if we do that, I believe that the work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. So as the evangelist, having a team, and you really need a team, a team of committed people who will go along with you, who will have that same vision, and you're always putting fire in them, putting more vision in them, so that the work will be done. The same thing for women who are here. In our own church, uh, we have a women's section. You heard when I announced in the church yesterday that they'll be meeting in the zones. But we do not allow the women to become another separate church within the church. Because if we're not careful, that tendency is there. That some of the women will begin to say, what a man can do, a woman can do. As in the church, there was, uh, when we started with, uh, you know, teaching, the women will teach the women, and then the men will teach the men. We started that because we wanted them to help the people in the zone, because we have so many women, thousands of them. And we felt that these women leaders will be able to help them in their families, they'll be able to counsel them, they'll be able to show them. Do you know, we, we tell them to teach them a lot of things. In fact, this Wednesday, we have given out money to every zone. The woman leader in the zone is to prepare a type of soup, is to take it to the fellowship. All the women that are attending that fellowship this Wednesday, they are to taste that soup. After they have eaten it, he'll say, sit down, take paper and take pen and write the ingredients. When you get back home, prepare it for your husband. So they're not teaching them doctrine. They're not teaching them, um, you know, if you don't uh, get holy, you will go to hell. They leave that to the pastor. The pastor will do that when they come to church. But over there, how to sew their baby's dress, when little children have measles, what to do, and when the child has convulsion, what to do. We call nothings in our church. We say, teach the women leaders about if this is happening to children, if this is going on in their families, what to do. And then in the zones, they'll collect all those women together and they'll tell them, if your children have anything like this, if they have something like this, this is what to do. We don't have time to teach them that in the central church. So we say, you women, that is your responsibility, go and do that. Titus said that the older women, the aged women, will teach the younger ones how to love their children, how to care for their children, how to make the homes, how to do a lot of things that the husbands will become happier. Last month, they, ta they taught them how to set the table that you don't uh, allow your husband to be eating, and then the soup has finished, and said, Mama Lu, come, oh. the uh, soup has finished. And then the woman will take the plate in front of the husband, and the man will be watching. Five minutes later, they will bring the thing. The hand of the man is dry. He washes it again. <laughs> so we told our women, we say, teach the women in the church. When their husbands are happy, the church will be good. When the husbands are happy, if I want to get offering from them on Sunday, they'll bring much offering out. <laughs> but, you know, if the man is not happy, I can't get enough workers in the church. The people will not do what the pastor wants them to do. They have too many family problems. So we tell the women, help us solve the family problems at home. I told you that to tell you that the women, they also have their place. But we do not allow them to take over the church. But when we started it at our uh, Sunday school, uh, one of the people asked a question. And he said, I see that now. What a man can do, a woman can do. I said, who told you that? He said, because they are teaching and the women were also teaching. I said, yes. We want them to practice communication, how to talk. We, we want to listen to them, how they talk in the church. 
so that because I cannot go to every zone where they were divided Lagos into zones, I cannot go there, I would, uh, you know, be so tired. But if I listen to them talk in the church, I will know that is how they are going to talk in the zone. And that's why we're making them to teach the women. And you see, if we do not do all these things, then our supervision will be lacking. So supervision is very, very important. And you know, what I was saying is that God gave the pattern to David. And then he gave it to Solomon. Even though Solomon was intelligent and wise, yet he still needed that pattern. And we need to understand that our people need the pattern. Then I said that we learned from the Old Testament that the Father gave the pattern out. How about Jesus Christ? How did Jesus do it? Let's look at some references in the New Testament. Mark chapter 16 from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. The way to build the church is through preaching. Without preaching, the church cannot be built. People will be saved by the foolishness of preaching. And here Jesus Christ himself said that we must go and preach the gospel. You know, it's difficult preaching the gospel. In the church in Lagos here, the people are excited and they come because they know that I preach. I pray, I counsel, I do other things, but first and foremost, beyond everything else, above everything else, I preach. That's the foundation. If we're going to build the church, we must preach. Go, preach the gospel. And they know that when I come to preach, I get prepared. And preaching, preparation, takes me time. Even with all the experience I might have got, it still takes me time. When I pick up a passage, I take Matthew Henry, that's uh, commentary. I take Bible, Beacon Bible Commentary. It's, an, it's a whole series, it's uh, 10 volumes. Uh, Matthew Henry has one volume, Matthew Henry also has six volumes. I have both sets. If I'm in a hurry, I use the single volume. If I have all the time I need, I use uh, the other volume that has more. And then uh, there's Adam Clark. That's also a whole commentary on the whole Bible. And I look into all the passages. Sometimes I take names, topical reference Bible. And uh, that, if I need any reference on faith, I need any reference on, on anything, all those things are there. Sometimes I take my Bible dictionary out, voluminous thing. That will give you the meaning of every word that you are looking for. And so after getting through all that, I form all the, I just write all the good points I see in, those, uh, in all those commentaries. And all the references I can find. Without any arrangement, just write everything down. Very, very rough. Then I know that if I'm going to actually preach effectively, I must introduce the message. So I'll be looking for introduction material. And that introduction material I can get from, there are books on illustrations for preaching. Now those things, they really help. And then after the introduction, I will need to build up the body of the message, like a structure. You know, if a man is going to build a building, there is foundation. Then he has, um, you know, the place where the door should be, where the windows and everything should be. And then I need a conclusion, which will be the climax. And it takes me time. But they know that because I prepare for them, they are eager to come. And um, they know that whenever I give out messages, they don't think maybe the pastor is resting. They think maybe he wants those other people to be trained. Because they know that I will really teach them. And you'll see, when you were the third service yesterday, I acted as if that was my first message in the morning. Because I do not want any part of the church to come and say, oh, the pastor is tired. 
Because if they feel like that, they won't come to that service anymore. They will all come to the first service. But when I'm handling the fifth service, if you were the last service yesterday, you will think that that was my first message. Because in my mind, I think as if I've not done anything today. That the people already have gone. If I'm going to be successful as a preacher, this is my congregation now. Please, turn the cassette over. That the people already have gone. If I'm going to be successful as a preacher, they, and I'm at my best, and then I make them happy, make them feel as they ought to feel, if I want to rebuke them, I put all my energy into it, and immediately I finish that uh, fifth message, then I go away, I don't counsel on Sunday. Now, I don't explain to them that I don't counsel because they don't know that pastor needs food, pastor ever gets tired, they don't know that, but I know it, and you know it as a pastor. <laughs> but I just get away from them. But if you don't concentrate on that preaching, if it's only one message you are giving for the whole week, preach it well. If it's only one message for the whole month, preach it well. Then they will be eager when you are coming the next time. Now you see the people here in the church in Lagos. They listen to me on Sunday, they listen to me on Monday, they listen to me on uh, Thursday. And they don't ever get tired and they don't say, well, why, don't, why doesn't he get out and let another person talk? Because they know I really prepare for them. That's the foundation. If we're going to build the church, we must preach. And Jesus said, go into all the world and preach. When you hear good preaching, don't you know it? Don't you know it? Of course you know it. When somebody is, uh, you know, preaching at the crusade field, and you know that all his energy, all his life, everything is there, and it doesn't appear that he, he remembers any other thing except just to call the people to come to the Lord, you know that's a preacher. But when you listen to another person who has written everything down, and he doesn't look at the congregation, and he says, their brothers and sisters, this morning, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God. We will hear this wonderful message. And I pray that God will apply it in your heart. According to the Bible. <laughs> now, when you listen to somebody like that, you'll be looking at your wristwatch. <laughs> the women will be trying to put on their shoes so they can go home in time. But when you listen to somebody like Friday night, that was a message. You don't think that he should end. Now you know, when there is preaching like that, the church will enjoy it. The people will enjoy it. So the foundation of the work of the Lord is that we must preach. But then in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, we must teach. We must preach. We must also teach. Now, if we don't teach, what will happen is that our members will be running about looking for something to satisfy them. But if we teach soundly and effectively, the people will not be running about. And whatever we are teaching, let us teach effectively. You know, sometimes what disturbs us in teaching is that instead of teaching just one subject at a time, we want to teach four subjects at a time. We bring in this, bring in this, bring in this, bring in that. But if we just stick to one subject at a time and we get through, whenever you are teaching, think about the misconceptions of the members of the church that you need to correct. Think about some things you already know, but that is becoming stale, that you need to emphasize. Think about new areas of truth that other people might be presenting, that you need to open the eyes of the members to make it full, make it rich, and let it flow freely, and let there be illustrations and Bible quotations to make sure that everything is emphasized 
and it's understood. And so there must be preaching, then there must be teaching. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself, pattern for the building. But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come up upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in all Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. Many times we've listened to preachers who have said the early church made a great mistake. They stayed in Jerusalem too long. And then God had to scatter them with persecution. Maybe there is an element of truth there. But maybe there is something we have forgotten which we have not learned. That it was very good to have a strong headquarters. Then the branches will be able to depend upon that headquarters. How do we, do, how do we build? You have these pillars that are very, very strong. Then you have all the other little, little pillars that depend upon the big pillar. Sometimes why the work doesn't progress is that we're too much in a hurry. We have established the headquarters. We're not more than 50 there yet. Then out of those 50 people who should help us to strengthen the headquarters, we send him out. The person that is a prayer warrior, mighty in prayer there, we send him out. The person that is able to teach Sunday school effectively, we say go and establish another branch. The one that is able to act as a motivator, gather the people together, we send him out. The one that is able to lead the music that at the headquarters, they will say that if you really want to worship the Lord, go to that place. The one that is able to do that, we say music is not important. Go and be a pastor in another place. And it's a musician, it's not a pastor. And we make the headquarters weak. There's no finance. There are no instruments, there is no church building, there are no workers to help at the headquarters. Make Jerusalem church strong. That's the pattern. And after we have made the headquarters strong, then we can begin to send out people. Send out people. Now what we did in deeper life, sometimes some people have asked questions like my brother said this morning, that what is secret? The secret is all we're exposing to you now. But... When we didn't have enough money, what we did in Lagos, after Lagos had been a little bit strengthened, I called some of the people in Lagos that could teach that I knew that the calling of God was upon them. I said, what are you waiting for? Go to your stage. We're not going to pay you. you will, the work you're doing in Lagos, try to seek transfer. And then he saw transfer. He got on those stage. He was doing the work or not paying him. The government was paying him. But he saw transfer to get out of Lagos so as to establish deeper life in that stage. And the brother who is um, at Enugu, uh, I said, brother, how about it? He went to Enugu. He was working on his own. The government, his uh, company was paying him. The brother in Bendel State, that's how he went. The brother in um, Emo State, that's how he went. Most of our people, that's how they started. And because it wasn't too heavy on the headquarters here, we could spend our money printing tracks, we could spend our money doing other things, and then we could invite people to retreats, and then we could give them food. And people would say, ah, deeper life, they are very, very rich. No, not that we are very rich. But that we try to conserve the money. And originally, I told those um, overseers, state overseers, I said, except your company gives you a vehicle, church is not buying vehicle now. Let get, let's get the work started. And then in the state, the capital of the state, the headquarters of the state was trending. They didn't immediately begin to say, now we're here, when they were just about 40 or 50, then begin to send people to the local government areas. They strengthened the capital of the state. After straining that capital of the state, now they could send people out to the local government areas. If we strengthen the Jerusalem church, then we'll be able to get to Samaria, then get to Judea, get to the uttermost part of the earth. Sometimes we're too much in a hurry to send out missionaries. And um, we still have in mind that by the grace of God, we're still going to, in later conferences, talk on how to maybe some of us denominations will group together and send a missionary to a particular country. 
or maybe we'll say you denomination send a missionary to this country another denomination don't worry about this country already this denomination is doing that you send to this area and we divide the work among ourselves and then we'll see how the how the continent how the continent of Africa can be reached from Nigeria because Nigeria is a giant for the gospel and we can do it but it takes proper organization proper administration that it is not that we're spending so much but before we do that headquarters has not been strengthened but let us see the pattern that Jesus Christ gave to these people you know Jesus Christ himself he was in Galilee he strengthened the work there after that he said we must go to the next towns and villages when everybody was not looking for him when his fame had gone everywhere in that community it was then he said we must go to the next towns and villages and so in our various churches let us strengthen the headquarters or if you are just uh, maybe pastor in a town let's say your denomination has sent you to Bini city now before you uh, go to establish another branch why not send why not uh, strengthen the first branch if you want to have three branches or five branches in a town well we in deeper life people have asked us why don't you have so many branches in one town why well, we say it's not a sin neither is it wrong but when Jesus was writing to the uh, churches of Asia he said to the angel of the church at Ephesus one church to the angel of the church at Smyrna to the angel of the church at Pergamos right and we have discovered that you see if let's say our church at Ibadan if there were 10 branches at Ibadan nobody will know them you have 200 there you have 300 there you have 500 there but when all those people when they come together and you see them they say deeper life has got all the people at Ibadan because they are all together it is likely that the CAC church at Ibadan will be much 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 more than deeper life but there are many branches the Catholic church at Ibadan will be much much more than deeper life and all the assemblies of God at Ibadan, it is possible that if you add all the members together, they are likely to be much, much more than deeper life. But because all those deeper life people, they know only one place. But you know, if we had 20 branches in Lagos, and I'm pastoring over one of the branches, and I have 2,000 people under me, you wouldn't see the impact of the church that way. Now, please, I'm not saying that you go back now and you say all the five branches, <laughs> of our church in this town come together, you know, there'll be a problem. When they come together like that, there'll be one pastor. Then the pastor of the other branch that we have matched now, who has been preaching every Sunday before, the, he doesn't come to his town in three months. And when he sits down, there's no message to preach. He might write you a letter of resignation and say, I am sorry, since you now have deeper lifestyle, I'll go and establish my own somewhere. So please, don't go back and bring confusion. And don't go back and tell your overseers and say, now we must have only one church. I'm only giving this as illustration. Do we understand? And so, when we're strengthening the headquarters, it will really help. Then, in John please write down Luke chapter 5 from verse 4 to verse 10 we can't have time to read that now Jesus told Peter from now on you will catch men that's what catch how do we catch men there must be incentive if you're going to catch fish you have bait you have net it's true we can pray but there should be incentive now, if you're going to make the church to grow, understand that you are fishing. And if we know that we are fishing, we'll need to know what the people actually need. In um, January this year, I announced in the church 
or printed handbills. And we said, this year is going to be a wonderful year, a good year. And we're going to have January as a covenant month. And I said, you must come. Begin the year with God and invite other people to come. Because of that incentive that they could come and make covenant with God, they all came. Then, at the end of February, I knew that if I didn't say something, they would say the covenant month has ended. The incentive has been taken away. And I wanted to treat the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not be a false witness. But if I announced to the church and I said, Now, church, this February, I am going to talk on the Ten Commandments. And those of you who are stealing, you come in February, you will hear a message. All those of you committing adultery, you come in February and you are here. I'm going to talk on Ten Commandments. I didn't say that. I said I was going to talk on the secrets of covenant blessings revealed. That you don't know. You've been coming to this church for years. You don't know those secrets. Covenant blessings. And that... I've been studying this thing myself as a pastor. You know I'm surprised so much in the Bible. I studied this thing for years and I've just discovered I don't want to talk too much come in February. And then I put on bills in their hands. And when they came in February, I said I'm going to talk on the secret of divine protection. What's that secret of divine protection? I gave some promises. And then I, I said, if you want God to protect your life, you must honor and respect and protect the lives of other people. That's why God said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> then they went away. I said, next Sunday, I'm talking on the secret of happiness in the family. And they, they came, pastor is going to talk on secret of Happy family. When they came, I told them about family. God loves the family and we ought to be happy. That the only thing that can make a man to be uh, defeated in life is only if the family problem is unsolvable. And after saying that for a few minutes, I said, now, God has made provision. For you to enjoy that provision, stick to your wife, don't look at another person's wife. Look at what the Bible says. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The following Sunday, I said, now you must come next Sunday. Because next Sunday is a formula for prosperity. And many of you don't know the formula for prosperity. Your work, your work, your work, your labor, no money, no job, no prosperity. But the formula... That God gave from heaven how you can be prospered, come. And they all came. You see, I'm trying to catch fish. You need a bait. You need incentive. You need encouragement. You need to throw that thing out there and the people will come. So I said the formula, divine formula, is sent from heaven on how to prosper. And they all came. When they came, I talked about some promises. That's how I was starting. You start in a positive way. If you immediately start with a negative thing, thou shalt not. Some of them will close their Bibles while you are reading. So, after giving some promises, then I talked about Achan. I talked about some other people. And then I said, you know, if God is going to provide for you, don't try to do it your own way. You do it your own way when you steal. What you are stealing, God will judge you for it. But let God provide for you. Abraham said, I will not even let the king of Sodom make me rich. God will make me rich. They said, yes and amen. And then I opened, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> so, even when you are going to preach a message that is serious and firm, let's catch men and women. You saw yesterday, how I was talking to them. And because you were there, I used you. And I said, 
don't make me ashamed tomorrow. That look, all these pastors are here. They have heard great things about deeper life. They saw you on Thursday, how you overflowed. And now they are here on Sunday. That I'm your pastor. If you want me to be happy, Monday Bible study, you must come. That you know if you don't come, these pastors will think that you are bread and butter Christian. You only come for miracle. And they, don't, they won't like to think that they are bread and butter Christians. Therefore, they will want to come. And then I told the women, I said, you women, I talked about women last uh, Monday. And this Monday coming, I'm going to talk to your husband, drag him here. If you know how to make a delicious meal, do it for him. And then tell him after that, I did that for you so that you can be at the Monday Bible study. You know, that's our relationship. That's how I deal with the church. They laugh. They are happy. They, they want to, even when I'm not preaching, if I just want to make announcement, and another person is preaching, I come in there, and I plan my announcement. I, I would look at dictionary. I would look at illustrations. I would look at the things I want to use. I write everything down. And then I will read it during the week. So when I'm saying it, it doesn't appear that I wrote anything down. And I look very, very free. And the people also look very, very free. That's father-child relationship. That's how the pastor must do. That's how general overseer must do. And if we're going to catch men, we really need to be able to have all these baits out there. Then John chapter 21 from verse 6 to verse 8. I told you before that it may be a little long message. You think it's all right? Thank you. Now, after they had caught the fish in John chapter 21, Jesus told Peter, feed my lambs. But the very next verse, as our brother preached on Saturday night, explained, he said, feed my sheep. I looked at that and I said, Lord, feeding the lambs that are young and feeding the sheep that have been much more in the fold, looks like there's a difference. And we need to understand that when we're feeding the young, young people in our church, uh, we tell those who are coming for the first time, we tell them to stand up. Because we were there yesterday, and because we were occupying the space, we would have put them. So we didn't tell them to come to that place. But what we normally do is that all of those newcomers, they will come to an empty uh, space were provided for them. Then after, the, um, after that uh, meeting, a minister will talk to them. At the end of the month, all the people that came newly for the whole month will bring them together and we have a program with them. And then we talk to them about salvation, knowing the Lord, and then those who are saved will begin to tell them about water baptism. They go into the baptismal classes. Then later they will be interviewed if they are really born again. And then they will be baptized in water. Sometimes we do not have any program for those who are new in the church. And the new converts that are very, very zealous, they want a lot of things. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then he also said, feed my sheep. If you notice last Thursday, you might discover there was a difference in the, in the revival that we attended. Now, in the revival of the second service, maybe you overheard, you had come at the second service, have you? And you overheard some of the things I said. Now, the third message was different, not because you were there alone. But because our old, old members, they live all around Bagada. And members of the choir, ushers, uh, house fellowship leaders, many of them that have been very old in the church, they left where they were living and they came to live around. And the majority of them are the people that attend the last service. Whereas the people that attend the morning session, the morning session people, 
are generally those on shifting duty or those who don't, uh, you are not too busy in the morning. Many of them might not have been very, very long in the church. In a second service too, we do not have the proportion as very, very large. When I say very, very large, that may surprise you. Between last year and this year, we have grown by more than 5,000. So when you have 5,000 that have not been up to one year in the church, that's a large number. You say, how do you get more than 5,000 in one year? That's all that I'm telling you now. And you'll have the same story to tell by the time you come in October. <laughs> if you notice, if you note down all these things, and any of these things that are not clear, ask our state overseers and say, um, Brother Kumoyi said this, this, and this on how you get newcomers, how you do this, but I didn't really understand how to work it out in my church, and here we are in the same state together. Can you help me? He'll sit down with you, and he'll explain more than what I'm telling you now. And I believe that if our state overseers will do that, you too will experience tremendous growth before you come next time. And so, because of that, at the last service for Monday and for Thursday, Sunday is different because Sunday we have divided them into zones and there are some zones that ought to come at a particular time. Now, the uh, people that come at the last service, because they are the sheep, the other ones lambs, most of them, because these people know a lot, I do not want that uh, section to drop. Therefore, I will give them real material more than I gave the others. But I don't tell them. I just give them something that will satisfy them. Once they are satisfied, they will come back again. If you are in this restaurant and the food was good, but the other day you just ate in this restaurant, you say, ah, so this restaurant was in this corner and the food is very, very good, this restaurant will lose you as a customer. Am I right? So, if you prepare your message in the church very well, you're feeding the lambs, the lambs are satisfied. You're feeding the sheep, the sheep are satisfied, they will come back again. And that's the important thing. But then, to keep our people, we have not only done this in giving them good message, feeding them as lambs or feeding them as sheep. You know, we learned this as fellowship from the Bible, and also from Korea. We sent many of our uh, people to Korea and they learned some of these things. Now in Korea, they have their house fellowship cell groups during the week. They don't have it on Sunday. But we have a house fellowship on Sunday and I'll tell you why. We discovered that for our own people and for Nigeria in general, if you have a service like we had yesterday, that the people are to come for their service at 5 o'clock in the evening, in the morning, a real Christian will be feeling the desire to be somewhere. Am I right? Therefore, if he knows that his service in his church is to be at 5 o'clock, he will go to another church in the morning. And if that church knows what I'm telling you now, that church will make him a Sunday school teacher. We lose him, and we don't like to lose him. And so you know what we do? We tell him that his house fellowship is 10 o'clock in the morning. His service is 5 o'clock in the evening. So in the morning, he doesn't run anywhere. He goes for house fellowship. In the evening, he comes to the church. That's why he remains a member of the church. In the morning, those who come to the morning service, in the evening, if you don't do something, in their mind, they just feel like they want, they say, word of God is never too much. Singing is never too much. Praying is never too much. They run to another place. So we tell them, your house fellowship is 7 o'clock in the evening. Those who come to morning session, they have house fellowship in the evening. Those who come to evening section, they have house fellowship in the morning. Now, can you blame us for that? That's, the Lord said, we are pastors, we'll watch over the people. 
and if they are members of the church, let them be committed in that church. In your own church too, do something that your members are committed. Then they will not be running about. They will not be running up and down. If you are going to have house fellowship, have house fellowship. If you are going to have evangelism, have evangelism. But make sure that it is well supervised so that they are really cooperating. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, Jesus talked about church discipline. If somebody has offended, said, go to that person. If he doesn't hear, take another person. If that person doesn't hear again, still look to the local church. And whatever final decision the local church takes, that will be the final thing. Which means that Jesus knew that there will be local church. And there will be discipline in the local church. Now, our general overseers will be hearing about discipline um, in their seminar this afternoon. But in our church, we look at the Bible and we discipline people. And you know, sometimes, especially in Lagos here, when people are under discipline, they know that this is discipline. And sometimes, if somebody does something that is so, so terrible, like a person commits adultery or fornication, we might even send him out of the church. But when we do it, we do it in love. Because of that, they are at alert. And they really work. It looks small and little. But these are some of the things that are helping us. You may not be able to start it all immediately now if you've not been doing it, but I believe that by and by, things will become better. Because of a time, I'll not be able to, you know, if it's too much, you'll be overfed. So what we've learned today is that God himself will build the church, but he will use us. Let me just give you these seven points before I close. Number one, the church must be a saved church. Emphasize salvation. Two, must be a steadfast church. Make the people committed, like your own children in the family. Steadfast. Number three, a studying church. Make them to study the word of God. Now, you know, what we've discovered in some other churches is that your Sunday school. People don't come. The reason they don't come is that maybe the pastor himself doesn't come for Sunday school. The people feel that if that Sunday school is important, the pastor will be there. If the pastor is not there, it means Sunday school is not important. But you will notice yesterday, when you started the third service, before we ever started at all, you saw the people sitting there in their various classes. And you saw that with a large church, with a large attendance of the third service, the people really came in large number for their Sunday school. We call it Sunday Scripture, but whatever the name, Sunday school. So it's very important that we make the church a studying church. And then I study the material myself because they can ask any question. You see the young man that asked the question after the uh, Sunday school of yesterday and asked about predestination. Now, if I wasn't ready for him and I just said, did your teacher mention predestination? And he said no. Now why are you pulling the church back and you're asking predestination, predestination? Sit down. Any other question? The people will be intimidated. So make it a studying church, a saved church, steadfast church, studying church, a soul winning church. Let the people evangelize. That's how the church will grow. Motivate members of the church. Everybody must be soul winning. They must be winning souls. Then a separated church. That is, they are not of the world as Christ is not of the world. Let there be a distinction between the church and the world. 
then a spirit-filled church. Spirit-filled. Saved, steadfast, studying, soul winning, separated, spirit filled. Number seven, second coming church. Let the people be conscious of the fact that Jesus is coming again. That's what they did in the New Testament. They made sure the people were saved. Then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They studied in fellowship. And evangelism went on from house to house, and the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. They were separated from the world. Come ye out from among them. They were spirit filled. Have you received the spirit since you believed? Second coming church. They knew that Jesus will be coming again. I pray that from all these things that we have heard, God will use the little, little things we have shared together. Our churches will grow. And our churches will be strong. And the power of the Lord will move in a dynamic way in all our churches in Jesus' name. As we go, let's build according to biblical pattern. If we do it the Bible way, we'll have Bible results. Let's rise up and pray. I think we ought to take some decisions. Not just pray, but to make some commitment in prayer. That the Lord helping us, our preaching will, in, will improve. That in definite ways, the Lord will give us messages, we will labor on the messages, and our churches will become virile, exciting places in Jesus' name. So let's pray about the preaching aspect because the church is built by preaching as one of it, by teaching and then by the house fellowship, by discipline and all the other ingredients. So let's ask that the Lord will help us in committing ourselves to doing these definite things in Jesus' name. Let's pray about that. Make a commitment. Commit yourself to doing something. Change the way you do things for better. In your private study. In prayer. Amen. I believe we also ought to pray about our leadership qualities. Somebody who is not a leader or doesn't know which direction to go, if he is going to lead other people, if the blind lead the blind, they will all fall into the ditch. So let's pray that God Almighty, who is a leader, will also make us a leader. Let's pray about that. A God will make you a leader. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you very much. Father, we are grateful because of your favor. We thank you because of the revelations you have given us. We thank you because of wisdom that is given from above. And we thank you because of the learning experience we are having this week to change our ministries, to revolutionize our ministries, and to change us for the better, and that the grace of God might be much more abundant towards us. Lord, we pray at this hour, that the leaders we ought to be, the Holy Spirit will make us that leader in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray, the ingredients in the building of God that ought to be there, we pray that we ourselves will be full 
of the direction will be full of the material that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be empty in Jesus' name. Yes. Lord, we ask you for enlightenment in the scriptures, understanding in the word of God. Lord, we pray that as we study the scriptures day by day, you will give us special insight that as we open the scriptures, we will find bread, we will find milk, we will find meat, we will find bones, and we will give the necessary food to the necessary people in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, dear Lord. We rely on you and our eyes look upon you, and we know you will not fail us. And Father, we too, we shall not fail you. Thank you because we know you've answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.